We either continue with the long-term plan or we put all of that at risk with Ed Miliband and Labour, all of the things that got us into the mess in the first place. The choice at the election is clear. Strong and stable leadership with me in the national interest or a hung parliament and coalition of chaos under Jeremy Corbyn. That is too big a risk to take. I don't want an election. You don't want an election. Against the majority of public opinion. He isn't winning friends in Europe. He's losing friends at home. This is a government with no mandate, no morals, and as of today, no majority. Well, what a fucking week it's been. <laughs> um, don't know if an hour's going to cut it this week. <laughs> we delayed the show specifically so we can get all the best takes. It, yeah, it was. Uh, we were talking about recording something yesterday, um, but uh, well, saving it for today, I think, was probably a good move. <laughs> Hard work down the takes minds, but here we are. Yeah, absolutely. Jesus Christ, <laughs> I just I can't stop laughing today. It's it's definitely been a roller coaster. If the roller coaster was made of hugs and sunshine, it's a roller coaster I never want to get off. It's been phenomenal. Mr. Bojo's Wild Ride. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Should we do some introductions? Yeah. Uh, Hi, I'm Alistair. You can find me on Twitter at um, SA underscore Balistari. Um, I'm still from the south of England and I'm still really sorry. I'm Michael. Uh, you'll find me on Twitter at Mehal, M-E-H-A-L-L. Uh, I'm also the person who runs the at Praxis Cast Twitter account for the podcast. Find us on there. Tell us what you think. Tell us what we need to talk about. Uh, I'm from Glasgow-ish, um, and I, I'm probably sorry as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, my name is Ben. I am not from the UK, I'm a filthy foreigner, but I've been living here for about six years now. Yeah, that's about right. Um, And I am not on Twitter because I value my mental health. Probably a smart move. Yeah, I do. Given what's going on, but um, I'm fully on board on Twitter. (laughs) And I'm Jamie, I'm from Newcastle. Uh, If you want to for any reason, you can find me on Twitter at Jim Bob Freeman, but I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, and I'm David. I am again on the show, um, still around Glasgow, and still at Sanitary Nap Time on Twitter. Yeah. Okay. So um, it's um, a lot's happened this week, <laughs> but um, that, that's we're mildly. <laughs> oh wait, we need to talk about um, uh, how we make the podcast and everything, don't we? Sure. Yeah. It's probably a good idea. Yeah, um, so um, you may have noticed that we've got different people on this week. Uh, me and David are uh, were on last week's episode, but we've got uh, Michael, Ben and Jamie with us this week. Um, we are um, a collective of people who sort of uh, similar um, political leanings and outlooks on stuff that uh, sort of coalesce out of the Something Awful forums. And um, yeah, we pretty much intend to take, uh, you know... Uh, broad approach and get as many uh, opinions on all the shit that we have to slog through every week in the news and politics and um, yeah we're going to do the best we can with that but yeah and so to start off we have five dudes yeah well we don't want to don't want to push the boat out too far on our second episode do we yeah let's we're all about nuts. slow reform yeah, I mean, we're already pushing the boat out a little bit because we've got one more dude on this time. <laughs> there was only four of us last time. 25% more dudes. Uh, so what can go wrong? <laughs> right, well, we get stuck into what the fuck has happened this week. Well, it's been a, a wild summer and it all seems to have um, come to a crashing end and uh, I've really enjoyed it. It has been I, I... fucking amazing. I hope it's not come to an end. I hope it'll keep going. Yeah, I was about to say, it has been amazing, but I think it's optimistic to call this the end. It's come to a crashing middle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. We mentioned last week 
about proroguing Parliament and all the the trappings around how that was done. That intent to prorogue Parliament effectively decided what was going to happen this week and is the root cause of why this absolute shit show has occurred. On Monday, Boris Johnson swanned out of 10 Downing Street. He came out with perfectly groomed hair. <laughs> well, I think that's being generous. <laughs> no, 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 no. If you, if you look at the footage, it was properly done up. The, the comb had obviously just been taken away from him before the door opened. Everything <laughs> looked as if it was going to go fine. He walked up to the podium and he started to give a speech. <laughs> and then it all went wrong when he started talking. <laughs> yep. Because immediately after he started talking, he shat his pants. He <laughs> audibly shat himself because of a wall of noise from protesters, which... You could you could literally hear it on the mic, and he had one of those. You uh, can hear it on the on the audio mics, and I don't know how many of the listeners are familiar with the type of mics that they use on those podiums, but they are designed to not pick up anything, anything except for the person standing directly in front of the podium. It must have been like cacophonous. Just uh, they're all stood like uh, there's a huge perimeter around. The whole of Downing Street's locked off. You can't get in. So you're talking Mm. at least 30 or 40 feet to the nearest human beings. I'm clearly not counting the cops that are, or the cops or the journalists that are that are in Downing Street. (laughs) Yeah, there's certainly on any (laughs) certainly on any human beings in Parliament. (laughs) Yeah, he he came out to give a speech. It looked like he was giving one speech and then promptly shifted on to another speech. You could watch his hair become more dishevelled without speaking as it went on, as he got more and more flappy. It was the worst speech anyone has witnessed, and we've all seen Theresa May step outside and say, Brexit means Brexit. Yeah, it was. It's the, it's, uh, I was, was going to say it's the worst speech I've seen this week, but then he's given more since then, so... Yeah, we'll come on to that. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of content to get through this week, guys, and... Uh... It's all amazing. It has been genuinely impressive to see just how bad he is at public speaking. For a man who was trained his entire life for like to be prime minister and to be just absolutely shit at it in every single aspect. That implies that he's actually been paying any attention to any of that training, which he hasn't because it's been a birthright. Yeah, that's true. In fairness, he's self-taught, so it makes sense. <laughs> self-taught by <laughs> Oxford. I don't know why anybody ever thought that he was a good public speaker because every speech I've ever seen him give has always been the same sort of uh, blah, 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 blustering sort of, you know, he, he can't even string a coherent sentence together. But everybody just sort of, maybe it's because of this PR machine that he's it's, always had behind him or I don't even know. Yeah, it's literally. Just a, a testament to the ungodly power of hype, basically. Because he's just, he's always been a shithead, but he's always had the papers like cheering them on. It is a hundred percent PR spin machine. He is, that's part of the reason why he probably doesn't want to go to the polls as early as, um, as uh, quite as early as everyone thinks he does, because he doesn't have, he would then not have the, um, state, prop- well, essentially propaganda apparatus of being able to blast out official, uh, government. Uh, statements and stuff because that is his PR machine at the moment. Of course, you got um, uh, the bee lovingly licking licking up his uh, licking up his boots and everything. So, yeah, I mean, people often say that the the bumbling clown thing is just an act, and that underneath he's a he's a a, a shrewd operator. And they're sort of half right because it is an act, but it's an act to cover up his absolute like lack of ability and laziness. So there's <laughs> an article that I meant to mention to you guys previously but it hadn't been relevant um that i i think some of you might have seen uh, if i shared it um back in june that jeremy vine the broadcaster shared um uh, whilst the the tory leadership contest was going on i'll share it uh, in the chat and we can share it in the show notes show notes um, but I'm not going to go too in depth into it just now because um, it'll add time and we don't, which we don't have. But basically, it's a story of the first time Jeremy Vine met Boris 
at an awards event, Boris told a story and sort of presented in his usual sort of bumbling manner. And then how Jeremy met him about three years later. Um, and he repeated the exact same sketch. He went basically word for word, other than for the name of the award show, and did the exact same sort of bluster and forgetfulness and every segment of it. So 100% is an act. But the question is, everybody until now has been assuming it's because he's some shrewd, canny operator. He's a smart man. He's an Oxford man. He's a Billington man. What it actually is, is it's pre-rehearsed lines because he has no idea what's going to work on a given moment. You know that um, you know that uh, Hamlin's razor never attributes to mouse, but you can attribute to stupidity. Yeah, which I think sort of works okay for most stories because you're not sure if they're actually dumb or if they're just evil. But with Boris Johnson, it's Genu- just genuinely with Boris, I'm not sure where he falls on the Dunning Kruger because because I have no idea whether or not he knows he's not actually that good and that um, he's just felt like he can get away with it because until now he has. Well, I think if he if he didn't know, he fucking knows now. Yeah, that's fair. Well, just look at his, uh, <laughs> look at his ta- like essentially his like parliamentary tactics. Like the whole um, proroguing parliament was meant to um, you know run down the clock, and that's sort of all that's done is lit a fire under the collective arses of um, the rest of parliament, going actually no fuck you, and that seems to be a recurring theme throughout all of his actual. Uh, parliamentary strategizing, you know, uh, born from the brilliant mind of one Mr. Cummies. Oh yeah, Jesus um, Christ! Let's let's come back to him. Um, so anyway, Tuesday to carry on with our timeline of recent events, uh, Boris started what I believe was his first speech to the House as Prime Minister, and mm-hmm. almost immediately Philip Lee crossed the floor to join the Lib Dems, like literally crossed the floor, removing Boris's majority. You love to see it. It was pretty magical because if you watch the video of that, you can see Boris sort of looking up and uh, watching him cross the floor, and he it sort of only just dawns on him what's actually happening as he's just started his um, oh yeah. Speech. If, you, if you pause the video, you can pinpoint the exact moment his heart breaks. That sort of thing. <laughs> 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 yeah. So I mean, that caused some some discord in the the Lib Dems and who their LGBT officer left. They were fine with Tim Farron and his gay frogs, but um, yeah. <laughs> but Philip Lee's a bridge too far. Yeah, Philip Lee turns out a bit of a cunt. <laughs> yeah, so Philip Lee, for those who don't know, um, is a person who um, had said, and I'm going to need to get the confirmation of exactly what it was, but it was basically about denying asylum to um, immigrant, not asylum, but denying immigration rights to uh, immigrants with HIV is what it came down to, if I remember correctly. It was hepatitis. It was it hepatitis? But still, he's a massive cunt. If you needed any confirmation before that the Liberal Democrats don't really care about the Liberal part, then there is. Well, really, they're not really about all about the Democrat part. Either. No, but that was a given. Yeah, I mean, my, they don't give my... a fuck about that stuff. They don't give a fuck if it comes back. If uh, if there's another referendum and it came back leave, for example, <laughs> um, they would they would be like, oh no, it should still remain. Like it's my favorite part is that. As he left, the conservative LGBT Twitter account tweeted that they're glad to see the back of him, completely ignoring that he's been in the party for God knows how many years. Oh yeah, now that he's left of his own volition. Not that we've kicked him out, now that he's <laughs> willingly left us. <laughs> Not because We haven't kicked him out because he's abhorrent views on... Um, on people with STDs. It's, uh, we're just glad to see the back of him because he's gone. Like, great. Yeah, I mean, it's not... They're, they're cleaning up the party in tiny steps. <laughs> well. <laughs> However accidental it may be. <laughs> yeah, so anyway, um, following that, uh, Johnson lost the vote to take control of parliamentary business, I believe it was. Standing Order 24, um, which um, allows basically... the Committee of the Commons, the whole Committee of the Commons, to define the order paper um, under normal operation the government gets to say gets to decide what happens on any given day other than the however many opposition days that they grant per session. Um, whereas once standing order twenty four has passed, 
Um, it means that um, under whatever provisions are given under the Standing Order 24 bill, um, it means that the Commons themselves get to decide what's up for debate. Normally speaking, the Standing Order 24 bill includes a specific sort of purpose or bill that is going to follow up with. Um, if you've been paying attention, it's been used um, previously for the indicative votes back in March and previously. Uh, they also tried to do it over the summer um, before recess, um, but failed. And it's been used for various things in the past. Um, I think it was used for gay marriage at one point. Uh, it was definitely used over Iraq. So, yeah, so, I mean, winning that vote was a tall order to begin with. It wasn't helped by Philip Lee's departure. And in the end, despite threats that anyone who, uh, any Tories who rebelled would have the whip withdrawn, 21 rebelled. And in the immediate aftermath, um, people were saying, you know, it would be, it would be madness to expel, with, this, this, with a, a majority lost already, it would be madness to expel 21 more MPs. And in the initial, immediate aftermath, I believe Andrea Ledson gave a statement saying that they weren't being expelled, and but they had have their, their very last chance to behave themselves on Wednesday's votes. Yeah, it was Ledson. And everyone immediately like just took to Twitter to laugh at how much they, they bottled it. And then six minutes later, they all got sacked by text, I believe. Not all of them get taxed by text, but Rory Stewart was going on stage to collect the GQ Politician of the Year award at the moment when he received the text. what? Yeah, fucking hell. I mean, has it been a very slow year? So uh, I just... I just want to go back to how how many MPs they uh, that rebelled against uh, the government. Yeah, because it was originally going to be about fifteen. Yeah, ten to fifteen. And then a but, and then at least four, if not six, additional ones rebelled specifically because of um, Jacob Rees of Mogg's arrogance. Yeah, they specifically cited the things that he'd said in the lead up to the bill. Uh, I mean, well, I mean, it, it's some it's some top quality arrogance, really, isn't it? It's it's the best arrogance in the world. Nothing beats British arrogance, especially <laughs> especially not like Victorian dad arrogance. Again, it comes <laughs> down to the um, machinations of Mister Cummies. He's uh, he seems to be roundly putting his own foot in his mouth. Uh, well, I suppose putting Boris's foot in his mouth. I don't know. Oh God, you just wouldn't understand game theory, Alistair. You just don't understand it. <laughs> You're not rational enough. Just a rank amateur. You, you're not playing 12th dimensional chess. Yeah, we talked about it last week. And I don't know. I just lost. I stopped paying attention. And uh, yeah, now I now I just... Uh, I th something about cars. I don't know. Uh, made in Europe. <laughs> Give Jacob Rees-Mogg like, some credit here when it comes to his arrogance and how he chooses to display it. The guy is... As far as caricatures of posh people go, he is... As, as Jordan Peterson is to intellectuals Jacob Rees-Mogg is to posh people he's the Jordan Peterson of posh people he's not actually posh exactly he's just fucking cosplaying he married it. into the aristocracy he's a fake aristo I think you'll find he's actually just an intensely chilled relaxed guy he's just there to have a good time with good vibes you're mixing up with someone who's the same age as him Dr. Dre no, did you? He, he, you know, people have been making fun of him on Twitter for it, but he was just trying to find the good vibes in Parliament uh, the other day. That's all he was trying to do, and everyone's just harshing on him. And I don't think that's fair. Is that a Jess Phillips quote about Jacob Rees Mogg? <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't. I didn't talk about me enough for that to be a quote. Right, that's fair. <laughs> oh, I, I would like to note that um, Jess Phillips used the words "I," "I'm." or me, 55 times during the speech during one of these votes. You need to count it as 53, because two of those were quoting Boris Johnson. Is that a, uh, is that a new personal mm. best? Or? Almost certainly I've not. only just recently started counting, <laughs> and I dare say I will stop very soon, because it's <laughs> keeps so destroying. Got one of those clickers, except it's going to roll over from 999 <laughs> tomorrow. Yeah, can't click this damn thing fast enough, fuck's sake. <laughs> God, that's one in each hand. New podcast segment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so they, they kicked out 21 MPs, including, I believe, um, two former chancellors and Churchill's grandson. Churchill's I believe, grandson. I believe yeah. in total it's eight former ministers, specifically two former chancellors, including the chancellor from six weeks ago. 
I think it's, <laughs> it's not a big hit to the party, you know, they'll, they'll manage. There's a funny story about uh, Nicholas Soames, who's uh, Churchill's grandson, was that um, someone who slept with him said it was like having a large wardrobe falling on you with a very small key. <laughs> 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 the best news about all of the suspensions, um, uh, specifically referring to one of the ex-chancellors, is whilst a number of them are likely to retur- to, to, to stand as independents, um, presumably they don't, um, get to be um, conservatives and it's looking likely that they won't that means that Ken Clark's going to have to com- either compete as an independent or say do you know what I'm done here which means that Dennis Skinner's probably going to be the father of the house which should be a result because uh, he's always uh, always on the ball in parliament yeah as father of the house he actually gets like specific time given to him by the speaker as a response <laughs> to all major speeches so it's going to fucking own Oh, that'll be oh, wow, amazing. That, that will kick ass. Uh, uh, should we move on to Wednesday? Sure. We'll yeah. Talk about Wednesday a bit, yeah. If we must. <laughs> got, There's a lot so, happened in Wednesday. Yeah, so much has <laughs> happened. Wednesday, we had the votes on the um, second reading uh, of the um, bill um, after the, the Standing Order 24 uh, issues. Um, and um, that went roughly as expected at first. Um, Mm -hmm. what did happen was there were a couple of amendments that were selected most of those got defeated and you'll notice that I'm saying most of those because um, the government declined to actually put forward to tell well it's unclear whether they what exactly happened basically Stephen Kinnock had put forward an amendment to basically force the government to bring back May's deal because it is that which can never die. World's smartest man, Stephen Kinnock. Uh, I love. I. I. I think. I think we should make Kinnock our mascot because uh, that we're um, bad at everything. <laughs> well, there's that, but just. Well, that's the thing. Kinnock's Kinnock's amendment managed to actually get through because the government didn't put up tellers for it. After it went to division. Yeah. After it went to division, they basically offered. They basically said that they would oppose it, um, and then because they're the government, they get to have the tellers on the side that they are um, on either the eyes or the nose. But then they just didn't send any tellers to actually count the people. So despite the fact that yep. the um, uh, the no um, uh, lobby was full, and I'm hearing it was rammed, um, uh, it just didn't get counted. Because the government didn't, the government specifically didn't want numbers on how many people were, would vote against May's deal recorded. But that means that the government can theoretically hear. So they go right. We we you know we oppose this bill for whatever. Everybody goes into lobbies, um, refuse to send tellers, and they can just basically wave something through. I don't know why the government would want to wave through an opposition thing, but theoretically. They could just wave something through like that, even if all the MPs were against it. I can't see an, a, 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 another instance where it would work for them like it did in this instance, except for stupid delays. And all that's going to happen with it is the Lords are going to strip it out because of what happened, and it'll come back to the Commons, and um, Dennis Skinner will probably drag a tailor in place. I should point out that the closest that Stephen Kinnock has ever come to political success was this amendment being passed, and it <laughs> happened entirely by accident. That is Stephen <laughs> Kinnock's career summed up perfectly. Much, yeah, yeah, it's a reminder of just uh, his face after the um, uh, exit poll came out. Uh, <laughs> always, always springs to mind whenever he's in, whenever he's up to up to no good in the Houses of Parliament. His stupid dumb fuck face when uh, he finds out Corbyn actually did better than uh, literally everybody expected. Yeah, and his stupid dumb fuck face is currently hidden behind a beard that looks like he spent the last three days on suicide watch. It really is not <laughs> a great beard, is it? <laughs> the only reason that Jeremy Corbyn is as powerful as, as he is is his beard. Therefore, I must also grow one. And look what happened. They managed to get an amendment passed by accident, so <laughs> there must be some truth in parliamentary beard. I, I think that says everything about the quality of that beard. We've cracked the code. 
He needs to actually win. Uh, he needs to take the um, parliamentary beard, beard of the year award away from Corbyn before he can actually do anything meaningful. Though, <laughs> listen, if we're going to talk about left wing beards, and I know Stephen Gillick isn't left wing, but if we're going to talk about left wing beards, marks are nothing. I don't take half standards. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fully bald and beard. Oh no! Oh no! That's Stephen Kinnock. Shit! <laughs> take that back! Take that back! <laughs> well, no, it's fine because Stephen Kinnock isn't by any sort of by any measurable scale, left wing. So it doesn't fit into that contest at all. Yeah, so the um, we didn't actually specifically mention the numbers, but the standing order 24 vote from Tuesday was through 28 eyes, 301 no's. That was a majority of two, 27, um, of which 21 were the rebelling um, Tory MPs that have then had their whips suspended. That's not including uh, Philip Lee, who was officially a Lib Dem already by that point, despite it having been all of an hour uh, or so. Um, so uh, who knows how many former Tories uh, were involved, including Tig, Cuck, whatever they're calling themselves this week. Um, uh, and then after that, um, we had the actual second reading of the European Withdrawal Bill, um, which was 329 to 300, so um, basically the same majority. Um, that was 29 majority rather than 27, but um, I think Carolyn Spellman was the extra uh, dissenter on that one, who, for some reason, despite that being the actual substantive bill, um, hasn't had the whip withdrawn. Um, there were a couple of amendments, as we said, um, and then after all that and after the, the bill had passed, Boris went, I mean, I don't want to do an extension, so um, so uh, what we're going to need to do is we'll need to take it back to the people. I mean, I don't want an election, which is why I'm calling for an election, but um, Corbyn is too chicken to actually follow through with his demands for an election for the last two years. So what you'll find is that um, um, let's have a vote. And he lost hilariously. Um, so it required two-thirds, which is around 440-ish, best guess. Um, and he got 298 eyes, which isn't bad, but ignores the fact that if all the abstentions, which was all of Labour and all of the SNP and a bunch of the others, um, if all of those abstentions had voted no instead of abstaining, um, it would have outright lost rather than just technical loss. It's still funny, though, because you've got um, all your standard characters who uh, voted not specifically voted no against that um for example our friends in cucktig who very obviously don't want to lose their seats that they're inevitably going to do most of the lib dems as well um yeah most of the most of the new uh, new lib dems um i mean fucking chuck himself has something like a you know when it was 73 percent or something um 73 percent labor at the last election so he's losing his seat like that is guaranteed and I can't wait for the rest of these useless pieces of shit to lose their seats as well. It's going to be so cathartic. Unfortunately, the polling is indicating that Joe Swinson's probably not losing her seat, which is a pain. Um, but we'll Polls see how it aren't act- real. Polls yeah, aren't I was about to say, we'll, we'll see how it actually plays out. Um, oh my god, can you imagine if at the next election, Joe Swinson and Boris Johnson both lose their seats? Boris is pretty <laughs> much a ser at this point. His majority is only about 5,000, and momentum have been working since 2007. <laughs> so, yeah, 2017. Sorry, thank you. So, was his constituency <laughs> remain in the referendum? I don't know, but I can check. Probably was considering where it is because it is a London constituency, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, technically. Yeah, that's one of the technicallys. Uxbridge is right on the edge. Christ, these absolute wastes of skin. I'm just. I, I, I really. I want. I really want an election like ASAP. But at the same time, I really, really just want to, you know, put Boris Johnson through the through the grinder. This is the best bit. Boris Johnson literally cannot get himself out of power short of resigning as Prime Minister. It's the closest thing he's got to taking his hand off the reins at the moment. He cannot elect himself out of power. He is (laughs) an absolute... He's beholden to who is actually the Prime Minister, which is, of course, Jeremy Corbyn. And has been since 2017. (laughs) 
<laughs> really, oh, it really is staggering just how every single turn, every you know centrist commentator and um, I'll say centrist like Tories, but uh, just underestimate him at every single turn, saying hey, he's weak and shit and pathetic, and it's like, yeah, well, he's not perfect, but you guys keep seeming to just falling on your swords one after the other. But you this know, is what they do. They, they keep huffing their own farts constantly yeah. until they start to believe the hype that they're building around themselves in their wee bubble. And then all of his power immediately is regained because he keeps <laughs> fucking seeing them off because they think that he's, impos- he's, he's not possibly going to beat them. And every single time he fucking does. To jump back for a second, um, the uh, guest... The EU referendum wasn't done by constituents, it was done by area, and so the maths aren't exact, uh, it's not an exact science, um, but the estimated votes for Oxford and South Rissop, um was 57% leave, so it's actually a fairly high per- leave percentage area, but that explains how far outside of London it is for still being technically inside London. To jump back forward for a second, um, the fact that Boris has lost all of these votes in the last couple of days um, means that Jeremy Corbyn has now overtaken um, one Mrs. Margaret Feature, never heard of her, <laughs> as the um, leader of the opposition with the most defeats of the government. Um, he's at 41, she got 40. Uh, and he's done in it in a, short a thousand, span of time. In a thousand less days, thereabouts. It's about a thousand and ten or something, but there or thereabouts. It's about three years less um, that he's done it in. Um, and and uh, he has managed to overtake that, which obviously means that um, Labour are going to introduce a new socialist regime that lasts for eleven years, as Margaret Thatcher said. Well, I mean, if if the sort of inverse socialist uh, result compared to Thatcher's result uh, happens in twenty nineteen, then if we establish another, you know, uh, forty years of you know, socialism as the default um, political ideology, as neoliberalism has been since Thatcher, <laughs> then yeah, um, yeah we'll maybe well Brexit has been Brexit has been worth it. <laughs> yeah, but chaos with Ed Miliband can't vote for Ed Miliband. <laughs> <laughs> should we should we talk a bit about why um, they voted against an election? Yes. So basically, the Opposition parties have all agreed that um, have voting for an election that Boris is calling for, even though he's insisting he doesn't want one, um, before the bill that they've just passed in through the Commons is law is a bad idea. Um, because yeah. um, if it's not actually right through, then there's a couple of different tricks that Boris can theoretically play. Whether or not they're legal is of question, um, especially since, not to get into today's news, but um, uh, now that the, the government sort of ceded uh, a lot of the ground um, in terms of the Lords battle, and I'll come back to the Lords in a minute. Um, yeah. yeah. The other thing that um, Labour really are going to want to be, it, just, just from, like, you know, uh, for Labour's specific benefit, I suppose, would be the fact that Come October 31st, or November the 1st, rather, uh, if we haven't left the EU, then that is, you know, that is Boris Johnson's uh, primary electoral commitment to to the public um, since becoming Prime Minister is we will leave on the 31st. The- and if we haven't left on the 31st, what, what are, you know, the... Um, the entire uh, portion of society that he's been appealing to, the you know ultra hard, leave with no deal portion, uh, gonna think if we haven't left, he hasn't com- held to the one thing that he promised. The, and go on. The only issue with that, and it's why I think that whilst they shouldn't have agreed to an election last night, they should agree to it next week. As I don't, and I don't know the exact timing of when next week. Um, but I'm not one of these people that thinks they should wait until like after the EU Council or whatever. Um, the reason why I don't think it should be that long is we're basically in a general election campaign right now. Boris yeah, has basically true. already started campaigning, except mm-hmm. just now 
We don't have par down in place so the civil servants aren't restricted. We don't have the election reporting in place and we don't have election spending rules in place, which means that Boris can spend basically as much as Sajid will let him from the treasury budget on advertising HM government, which happens to be the Tories. He basically yeah. gets See, near unlimited funds to do so. The other side of this is, though, that we're actually, we are being held hostage by Johnson in this regard because even though this bill might pass by Friday, if the bill's passed on Friday, that's all well and good the bill's passed, it doesn't actually make a difference until the request for extension has been received and ratified by the European Council. Until that point, we are still in a bit of a limbo period. And if Parliament isn't there because it's dissolved for an election, it can't strictly come back to hold them in contempt for not doing it and force yeah. them to do it. So until Boris Johnson actually goes ahead and gets the ratification of the extension, we can't possibly vote for an election and have good consequences out of it. And there's a lot of there's a lot of silly buggers that you can play with that as well. For example, I saw someone say that he could ask his good friend Victor Orban to just veto the request, in which case the EU Council says no. The thing is, Orban can do that um, at the request of the Tories, whether or not Boris is in power. Um, if we have an election in October prior to the 31st of October deadline, um, the worst case scenario um, is that Boris gets an absolute majority and forces no deal. And the thing is, that's also true if he gets an election in November and gets an absolute majority because he can cancel the actions that have already been done. He can take us out. He can do this and that and the next thing. He can do whatever he feels like he needs to to, to make him look like a strong man to Farage. I don't think he'll get a majority because, I mean, look at this week. Um, the worst <laughs> realistic issue that we could have is that we could end up in a near enough unchained uh, unchanged. Uh, position to where we're at just now and that just means that the commons would need to, to hold them to account don't get me wrong it wouldn't leave much time to hold them to account but that just means that Berko is probably more likely to take more direct action against them I don't necessarily think Berko is going to lock him up as much as we'd like him to but I think Berko would be happy to say there's sod all time left I need to be proactive about how we hold them to account for there is um, contempt there is another option, which is, now that he's lost his majority, it is possible, <laughs> and now slightly more plausible, that a new Prime Minister could be put in place without a general election. Only if the current PM steps aside to allow it after a vote, vote of no confidence. Not if he fails the second vote of no confidence under the fixed term Parliament Act, in which case he has to step aside. More importantly, the big, the biggest issue with that sort of scenario is that you're assuming that the yellow Tories would back Labour. Well, which... the timing of it actually does help because the fixed term Parliament Act dictates that you must have a confidence vote and then a two week period for the government to reassert confidence. Now that two week period wouldn't see a softening on Boris's side of any way, shape, or form on how he's going to handle Brexit, which means that they're closer you get to that two-week deadline, there's only one other option that people can vote for. Never underestimate the unwillingness of any Tory, whether they be blue, yellow, or red, to say, I would prefer an awful Brexit that's probably not going to be seen as my fault to the mildest jam socialism. Not to mention that the Lib Dems have a good track record of promise, you know, b pr breaking their promises. <laughs> I, have, I have no bones about it however time does sharpen these fuckers minds you'll note that the last couple of days have been so good for opposition unity Absolutely. like ian blackford stood up after boris's prime minister's questions on wednesday and not once did he shit on corbyn every single week he takes a big steamy dump throws it at the government benches and then saves a couple of nuggets to throw at the labor benches <laughs> Every single fucking week this one week, he did not do that. Even the Lib Dems didn't do that. Joe Swinson doubled down on supporting a Labour MP's question to Boris Johnson. Like, it was the best unity against the government I've seen in Parliament 
fully topsy turvy land. <laughs> like, oh yeah, yeah, it's absolutely tiny train world. It's unreal. <laughs> yeah, Johnson, Johnson's just the man, the man of the hour to unite the nation. That's all that is. Yeah, mad. Can you? <laughs> who knew? Who knew that Boris Johnson would be the man to unite the country? <laughs> <laughs> let's move on we've still got a little bit of Wednesday to cover before we move on to today um, specifically the Lords so what happened was <laughs> there was a Lords bill put in place on Wednesday to basically set a set of rules normally the Lords doesn't have any time limits on speeches any time limits on debate any limits on amendments um, and the speaker is basically not as empowered as the common speaker is so basically anything flies um, yeah and what, is self-governing yeah and what happened was government peers placed around about 100 amendments in place and every single one of those would have long long speeches so what happens is for about 100 um amendments you have to give them at least a little bit of time to see if they're gonna not take the piss because if you immediately call a cloture motion on them, then that's the one time that the, the Speaker of the Lords might go, wait, wait a minute, give them some time. So you need to give them, you know, five, ten minutes or whatever. Then call a cloture motion, which means that you then debate the cloture motion. You then vote on the cloture motion to say this person should stop speaking and we should just have a vote. And then you have a vote on the amendment. And then you do that a hundred more times. So as you can imagine, that takes like, quite yeah. a bit of time. So the Lib Dem leader in the Lords had brought himself a doobie and a shaving kit with him, bit of a, uh, an advert of himself or whatever, a, a sort of a PR move on Twitter, but it was funny. And he's pretty reasonable in explaining how the Lords was going to work uh, in terms of the op- how the opposition needed to on Twitter. Um, I can't remember his name, but you should be able to find him pretty easily. They were saying that it was going to take about approximately half an hour just to vote on each amendment, which worked out as something like 52 hours of just <coughs> voting. Like, just, you know, the whole process of actually voting for the damn things, which is... So that's yeah. half an hour on uh, each amendment, and I don't think that even includes the cloture motions. I think that's just the raw amendments themselves. Yeah, absolutely. So double that, and you're talking 100 hours. Now we introduce the fun aspect of the Lords... The Lords sit until they deem that their day is done. By which I mean, if they had continued sitting, and we'll get into this in a second why they didn't, but if they continued sitting and the government had insisted on all 100 or whatever uh, many amendments, if the Lords continued to sit and the Lords continued to vote, the day is not over until they say it is over, which means it, is, it would still officially be Wednesday until they are finished all of their amendments no matter if that's in through to Thursday, through to Friday. Does that make them time lords? Well, some of them are <laughs> lords temporal. I tell you what, you um, the best thing, the best thing about all this, all these, um, you know, considerations for time is that um, they implemented the very excitingly named guillotine motion. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Which, unfortunately, unfortunately, does, does not involve not any French does machinery. Not, <laughs> Does Boo. not does not do what, quite what it says on the tin. Um, did they vote for the guillotine motions? I think they did. Yeah, excellent. Uh, <laughs> well, that's a self-correcting problem, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately, unfortunately, um, a guillotine motion in this uh, in this instance is purely um, a limitation on the amount of time that can be spent debating um, uh, amendment an, an amendment or amendments for a bill. That's so, what it went um, in the French that's... Revolution as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, enough of all this. So what actually happened in the end was the government saw that the Lib Dems and the Labour and the crossbench uh, 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 lords and a couple of Tory lords um, had all got enough resolve in them to say, do you know what? We're not having this. We're going to sit. We will sit until this works. Um, and we will keep it Wednesday until um, however long <laughs> as we need it to. So the government gave in. Um, so at half one, the, the Lords adjourned their Wednesday, uh, half one in the morning, um, with the understanding and the agreement that there would be ample time and ability for the um, relevant amendments uh, and the bill itself to pass through the Lords by 5 p.m. on Friday. Now, the 5 p.m. on Friday date and time was originally with relevance to prorogation. However, 
because of as part of this agreement um, and the fact that there are several Lords Amendments that might be relevant. Um, if a uh, Lords Amendment is successful in the Lords, the bill needs to go back to the Commons because the Lords can't just say, well, we're going to do this to a bill and then it becomes law. The Commons need to actually agree with the changes the Lords have proposed, which means that the bill needs to come back after it passes on Friday, needs to come back to the Commons on Monday, which means that the prorogation is at least suspended until after that's happened. And Jacob Rees, Mogg, the Leader of the House, has confirmed that much at least. I suspect prorogation will be paused, I want to say, until Wednesday of next week. But it might just be fully cancelled at this point, bearing in mind that they're going to go in recess for conference anyway. Okay. Um, well, I feel like it's talking about what will happen on Wednesday next week. I mean, there's so many things that can happen by then that it's basically impossible to predict who would have guessed Monday this week that this is where we'd yeah, be. Yeah, very real. But at the same time, um, with the prorogation and um, the reality of not having a majority in Parliament and, uh, you know, factoring in this, you know, uh, extremely aggressive... Um, these extremely aggressive parliamentary tactics of you know vote for this bill or uh, or vote the way we tell you to on this bill or we're going to boot you out doesn't quite work when you don't have the kind of majority that say um tony blair did i mean it's just the other aspect of that is that it doesn't really work if you then try and apply the same concept to the Lords, as the Tory party decided yeah. to try and do this yeah. week. They yeah, threatened the Lords with... Withdraw the whip. Yeah, they went threatened to withdraw the whip from Lords who opposed the... Who, sorry, who supported the opposition's bill, ignoring the fact that there's basically no real comp, uh, issue... Uh, there's, there's, there's no downside to the Lords doing it. Yes, it means they're not officially caught Conservatives, and yes, it means they can't necessarily sit with their pals and they need to sit with the crossbench peers... But at the end of the day, it's probably it's not going to be that long until there's a new Tory leader and they're probably going to be welcomed back in. Also, I'm pretty sure most of them have been lords since like the 1700s or something, so it is quite a big deal. Yeah, they seal them away in pods at the end of the night, so... <laughs> Actually, it's still 1796 to a lot of them. Uh, yeah, it's 1796 to a lot of Tories in the Commons as well. <laughs> that's, how, that's how they keep it... Uh, keep it on Wednesday until half past one on the Thursday, they just turn on the time dilation device. <laughs> so we've had Wednesday with all this procedural drama and then Thursday rolls around. You've got Re Jacob Rees-Mogg confirming the prorogations off until the no deal bill is through House of Commons and then this like very exciting legal drama so it turns into a slapstick movie where Boris Johnson gets hit in the face with a pie 50 times and then his pants drop down and it's just been <laughs> wonderful. Um, first, his brother, Joe, Jones, Joe Johnson, resigned. Jojo. Jojo, as we affectionately call him. Um, apparently he talked to Boris about it the night before and Boris just didn't tell anybody. Um, yeah, kind of thing you think you'd mention, wouldn't it? Oh yeah, uh, one another one of our MPs is going to resign. Yeah, it's unclear if he's resigned as a Tory, yeah. as an MP, as a minister, all three, some weird combination. Resigned as Boris's brother, if that were possible. <laughs> all we <laughs> know is that the Bojo bro Jojo goes. Yes. <laughs> um, no, I think he resigned. He resigned as an as a minister and as an MP. He won't stand for re-election. But does that, ah. mean, when he says he, he's resigning as an MP, does that mean he's resigning as a Tory MP? Does that mean he's uh, resigning as an MP effective immediately? Or does that just mean he's not restanding for election? I think it's he's, resi he's actually resigned uh, his ministerial role. Yeah, we know that. He's resigned the whip, but not his seat. But has he actually resigned the whip? Has he left the Tory party? Uh, that's what, that, uncertain with resigning the whip. But, but I as think an MP, what, I think he is in a state what... of quantum fuck. Yeah, <laughs> he's a qu he's a quantum state of Tory MP ishness. The best the best thing about this really is that the, his stated reason for quitting is that he didn't want he had this sort of issue where he was torn between 
family loyalty and what's best for the country. Basically, Kellen said, what Boris is doing is the fucking stupidest thing I've ever heard of. And so I can support him, but he's my brother, so I won't be mean about it. Yeah, and I mean, there's, there's about 321 million people on Twitter, and it feels like most of them pointed out that he's resigning to spend less time with his family. Yes, it's a joke that's even made its way to the US, somehow. Yeah, George K joked about it. It's very much like your dad making uh, that kind of joke to you. It's like, haha, well done, you did it. <laughs> <laughs> the low hanging fruit. Um, so that was a fun start to today. And then we had Boris Johnson's speech, if you could even call it that. Um, at uh in yorkshire at some sort of police thing it just looked like he (laughs) brought out a bunch of black shirts to stand behind him as he was giving the speech completely (laughs) fumbled (laughs) through the whole thing even by boris johnson standards had no idea what he was saying was trying to tell the cop to get the cops to tell him what they say to people when they arrest them And I'm fairly certain that none of them wanted to tell him. So he just fumbled through it as he does through everything. Because if they told him, then he would probably legally be under arrest. Um, Anyway, fumbled through that entire thing. Turned around. Saw one of the officers there collapse. Um... And then went, oh, are you right? Yeah, I'll just be two minutes. I'm just going to keep going. And f- <laughs> yeah, just let me wrap up. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was a classic Boris Johnson bit. I mean, a real, a real true like masterpiece of the form. It wasn't quite rugby tackling a child, but it's, it's up there. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, that was, a, that was a special one. I thought it was a really good metaphor with the uh, <laughs> police officer being the country. <laughs> And, you know, Boris starts just being like, well, you just, two minutes, let me just finish my thing, and then we'll we'll check on you. Yeah, I mean, so, and also today, I believe um, th- there's word put about that Johnson says he'll resign before he goes to Europe to ask for an extension. On oh, could Brexit. you imagine? No, no, he said, I would rather die in a ditch. Echoing oh, again, the thoughts, could you imagine? Uh, echoing the thoughts <laughs> of the entire fucking country. Oh, Boris Johnson has it. resigned and in a ditch. Oh, oh no! I mean, <laughs> I, I, I think he, it's not outside the realms of possibility that he resigned because I think it's fair to say he has a history of just being an absolute bottler. Like he just expects to have everything handed to him on a plate, and if there's any adversity involved whatsoever, he does not like it. I mean, after Cameron left, he was going to stand for the leadership, and then. He, he, he actually went to yeah, his press it. conference to announce his candidacy and bottled it on the spot because Gove uh, had said he would back him and then, like, backstabbed him. And, I mean, who was scared of Michael Gove aside from human children? <laughs> <laughs> Any other well-thinking sea creature is afraid yeah. of Michael Gove. It's a very, it's a very Lovecraftian es- uh, essence about him, isn't there? <laughs> The right honourable member for Innsmouth. The progeny of Dagon. <laughs> well, sometimes when I wake up in a cold sweat, it's because somehow Gove has made it into my dreams, just standing there drinking a glass of water. <laughs> <laughs> Clapping with his big fucking floppy fin could hands. Right, say- okay, I, w- I want to talk about that gif for a moment because could it you, is the could most... you really call what he does in that gif? Drinking. It is the most stunning piece of video I've seen in my life, right? So, <laughs> so you've got the obvious, you've got the obvious bizarreness of his, like his applause, right? But if you watch that video and look at his mouth, he's it looks like he's it looks like he's taken the m- most ridiculously huge pill of Mandy in that anyone's ever seen because his his mouth is just like chewing as he's doing it, and I he's can't... accidentally switched off his gills and he's attempting <laughs> to breathe. I would rather die in a ditch than watch that gif and focus on Michael Gove's mouth. Ah, uh, I can't stop. I can't. I can't not just. It's, it's. I don't know. It's. It's like the episode of The Simpsons where they're watching Homer's like fat belly just jiggling everywhere. I just can't. Can't stop looking. I would like to point out that. In most cases, it's very bad form to mock someone for their appearance, but that doesn't apply if they're not human. Correct. 
Oh my god, right. Um, I suppose we should uh, move on beyond today, shouldn't we? Yes, looking forward to a lot of things. Uh, we've got a few good things um, to think about um, coming up in the next few days. We've had um, we've had about 200,000 uh, people registered to vote over the last three days or so. Uh, most of which have been um, under 35, which is a very good thing, being as that's uh, one of Labour's, like, Key, key demographics. demographics yeah and um hopefully we're going to keep up the pace with that because uh, obviously the more the more youngins we get um registered to vote the more likely labor are to win yeah. in an election <clears throat> the tories and, too um, are interested in the youngins oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> i didn't so, name him dude that's not label <laughs> They're interested, but the youngings are not interested back. We've probably got to look forward to a, a few more people abandoning um, Change UK, the Independent, whatever it is. Uh, oh, it is it is some of the sweetest justice that um, those utter cowards have, sh- have faced since they uh, started. Well, you know, since they started plotting against Corbyn all the way back in fucking 2015. Yeah, because. I think oh, we're, all, just... we're all looking forward to the press conference when Gapesy joins the Lib Dems, aren't we? <laughs> Luciana Berger, Luciana Berger has joined the Lib Dems. She was technically part of the Independence, which I bet none of you knew was a separate thing. <laughs> yeah, um, I know. I know other podcasts have talked about this, but um... I, I actually, I actually did know that because I'm a connoisseur of dipshittery, so it wasn't news to me. <laughs> Cocktail Marxist Leninist. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So the, the the centrist parties have managed to do exactly the kind of thing that um, all your standard trot parties love to do. You know, splitting up because um, I suppose it would be anti revolution not anti-revolutionary enough in this case, but... Um, Insert Monty yeah. Python Life of Brian sketch here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, very much a, a very powerful Monty Python energy on this. Uh, and obviously we've got a vote for a general election. Feels like there's definitely going to be another one of those next week. Well, is yeah. Uh, the big question of another election is when, not if. It is pretty much a dead cert before the end of November at this stage, I think. Yeah. So, um, which would be, which would be um, a nice little birthday present for me. Um, I, I actually tweeted last year saying all I want for my birthday is uh, the collapse of the government. So it looks like I'm actually going to get it. So um, I'm very excited. <laughs> actually, so, um, that's so weird because that's what I wish for and my birthday was last Friday. Whoa. <laughs> Have you recently grown a beard? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, mine's December, so if we could sort of have a combined birthday party. <laughs> and there was a thing. There was a thing I saw today where um, apparently uh, Dom Cummings is trying to get in the, <laughs> the the central platform of the manifesto. He wants to be a No Deal Brexit. I was so worried about where that sentence was going to go. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, apparently, if if they if the Tories make No Deal uh, a, a manifesto pledge, then. Uh, Nigel Farage will get Brexit, the Brexit party to stand down and not split the vote. They split the vote, but apparently at least eighty Tory MPs um, are, are refusing to to stand as Tory MPs if No Deal is a manifesto pledge. So I think where they're headed there is if they if they cave and don't put it in as a manifesto pledge, mm-hmm. the Brexit party splits the vote. But if they do what Farage wants and put it in, there's probably going to be like, you know, the provisional conservative party form or something like that and, and split the vote that way. It's, a, it's certainly not not a good position for the Tories to be in. Uh, well, still. Because, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, with Farage saying that he would step aside uh, in that case, but then, you know, your choice is 80, MP, uh, 80 MPs potentially resigning the whip or... Um, having to put uh, go up against uh, the Brexit party, which uh, is cool as fuck for us, I suppose, because it's nice for the right to be split and vote for once. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm really looking forward to an election because I just want to see how badly Dom Cummings fucks it, because he's been portrayed as this sort of like this genius, you know, tactical genius. He's he was instrumental in, in the Leave vote. He, he he's read Sun Tzu. I mean, yeah, well, that's scary. Um, and, and he's just he's planning like a military operation and he literally they, they rolled his troops rolled into parliament on Tuesday and immediately caught fire it was just spectacular to watch and I, I don't think he's he's 
I don't think he's got it in him to even come close to winning the general election, but I would love to see him try. Just before we move on, I want to mention one more thing as well, um, because this is basically went un- completely under the radar. Um, a woman that threatened to kill Labour MP Don Butler on the tube, um, and that wasn't this week. This week, um, the woman has pled guilty to the courts, which means that this happened a while ago, uh, at least a, a week or two, normally a couple of weeks, um, and it's not been... In fact, I've just uh, double-checked it. It happened on the Jubilee Line on 6th of December last year that a woman threatened to kill an MP on the tube, and I hadn't heard about it. And I'm pretty online as things go, and I hadn't heard about it until this week when um, the Mirror had an article about um, uh, the fact that the the, the uh, offender has um, uh, admitted guilt uh, they pled guilty, so we'll see what happens. It's good news that um, number one, Don Butler hasn't been killed. Uh, number two, that this person um, was stopped and caught, and this and that and next thing. But it's just completely missed any relevant media attention. Why would that be? Is Don Butler a Labour MP? Yeah, and she's also she black. Mm, she is. Oh, yeah. oh, she's black as well. That was going to be my next question. Weird, weird yeah, how that funny, ended up that. getting skipped out of the major news. I'm going to guess she's not a melt. Now, Don Dawn Butler's a good one. Yep, yep. Yeah, it's weird that, weird that that wouldn't get much coverage. Mm. She's the first elected female African Caribbean government minister. So uh, as with any firsts for um, minority Labour MPs, she gets none of the attention or all of the attention. See Diane Abbott. <clears throat> mm. Oh, It's really weird that the press would be so bad with that. Here, would we like to talk about an example of why the press is complete fucking shit? We don't have time to do a whole other episode right now. <laughs> <laughs> so, Rory Stewart has written for The Spectator. Oh, I love a bit of Specky. So good. I mean, this is going to be fucking immense already, isn't it? I'm just going to lead with one aspect of this, which I've only just noticed as I want to start reading. This is published on The Spectator for the 7th of September 2019. Now, you might be listening to this after the 7th of September, but as of we record, it's the 5th. So I'm impressed by the spectator and their time machine. <laughs> they just use the one in the Lords. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, obviously. <laughs> um, but yes, Rory Stewart has written about... Uh, has written Rory Stewart. Am I still a conservative? And that follows that law about any headline that any headline that asks a question. Yeah, Betteridge's <laughs> law of headlines does apply. My parents gave me a subscription to The Spectator in 1984 when I was 11, <laughs> which I think is child abuse, to be clear. <laughs> of course it was in 1984. Born with a fucking vestigial spectator subscription. <laughs> the hideous part of that, that opening sentence is that the, the news that Rory Stewart is only four years older than me. He had a hard fucking paper round. He's, he looks like a fucking haunted marionette puppet. It, <laughs> Opium looks, will do that to you. He looks like a horse in a cunt suit. <laughs> <laughs> when I was 12, I wrote a letter to the editor criticising the progressive views of the Bishop of Durham and Charles Moore, who had just what become the editor at the Egypt and who had just become the editor at the age of 27, published that under the headline, quotes, very young foggy. Now, if you're complaining about the progressive views of a fucking bishop, <laughs> you're off to a bad start. A bishop in 1985. Yeah. 1984. <laughs> no, no, because it, it was a year later when they published his missive. Who knows what a weekly diet of The Spectator did to my impressionable mind? Um, my guess is turned it to um, mush and it will cause you to dribble it out of the re- of your ears for the next 30 years. Is Taki responsible for my taking up martial arts? <laughs> <laughs> or Roger Scruton for my views on ugly buildings? I think he's responsible for your views on, who you, on people that you think are ugly. Jesus. Are we going to bring up that that amazing fucking tweet of his from this week? Was it this yes. week? Yes, please. No, it was. It from, was I think most week. of it was from his oh. um, leadership no, contest. It was, it was a tail end of last week, wasn't it? Yeah, uh, the Rory Stewart loss edit. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just perfect tweet for pictures of him with randos he met, apparently. Um, Spot the odd he's only one. The only one he's not smiling in. The one with a black man. <laughs> Even better, though, was it was the web comic joke format of it where top left panel, big smile, top right panel, big smile, bottom left panel, punchline, no smile, fourth panel, big smile again. <laughs> See if you can share that in the show notes as well, David, uh, in case MD's missed Oh, that. yeah. Yeah, so and good. then there was, there was the follow up tweet after because he became he basically became Twitter's main character for the day. And then mm-hmm. the next day, his tweet was it was four all four images were him with black people forcing a smile. <laughs> Do you think that was harder for him or the black people? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's try and get it through the spectator article. I think it was the book reviewers so unintimidated by even the grandest book who made the greatest impression. They made the most flattering assumptions about the readers that I would have read Osip Mandelstam and, and had spent months with Carlos and made a close study of Pugin interiors. When I edited my school magazine, I copied the spectator right down to the font and the column shape. Such reverence is hard to eliminate. I was embarrassingly honoured when Charles Moore gave me high marks as a, quote, real conservative, unquote, two months ago. <laughs> yeah, real conservative by stealing other people's ideas. It, Very cool. <laughs> except I'm not technically a conservative anymore. I voted against No Deal. For the record, I am pushing for Brexit and against Remain, but think No Deal would lead to uncertainty, damage and division. This is particularly true for farmers in my constituency. The Prime Minister responded by deselecting me as the Conservative MP for Penrith and the border and trying to call an election. So having resigned from the Cabinet only six weeks ago, I find myself out of what remains of my job in six weeks' time. Oh no! I will be particularly sorry about this because I feel I am beginning to learn about some of the really tough hidden hidden issues in Britain. Oh, oh, he's (laughs) only just learning... How hard it can be to live in this country when he comes up to him losing his job. Are you not listening, Alistair? Oh, Those no. are these are hidden issues. They basically never come up. Damn. Oh, I wonder how he's going to cope with going to the job centre. Oh wait, is he going to have to go to the job centre? Is he going to have to go and apply for PIP at the D, uh, DWP? No, he's not the cunt. He's going to live a comfortable life for the rest of his days. He's going to. Oh. Oh my god, I'm literally mad at this right now. Well, I look on the bright side, if he breaks a leg, they'll have to shoot him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's really so funny. <laughs> and yet he would still he would still not be given money by the DWP for Pit because um he can walk twenty meters, so there we go. Trot. <laughs> I don't think he's it's a not joined the party yet. <laughs> Running I'm for very the leader. The podcast was splitting already. <laughs> <laughs> Running for the leadership in June gave me the opportunity to explore areas outside my constituency. Now, can we just take a sec for a, a moment for uh, and say this is the first opportunity Rory Stewart has had to explore areas outside of a constituency when he spent six months lost in Afghanistan. <laughs> In Northern Ireland, England, and Scotland, from Derry slash Londonderry to Wigan, I will give him credit, he says Derry first. He doesn't commit <laughs> to one or the other, so he loses yeah, I was points. Say, very, very non committal. <laughs> but he didn't just go down in Londonderry, which is what the normal Tory line would be. Last week, the last of the parliamentary holiday, I have been walking through communities in the northeast between Newcastle and Hartlepool. Oh, of course, he was walking through them. Last Thursday, I was in a food bank in a church which was feeding 70 people. The young Nigerian man who was studying aeronautical engineering was fit and confident, but he was the exception. What, what, why, was, why is he saying he was fit and confident? Tell us about his skull shape. You're writing in a spectator here. <laughs> <laughs> I did say he was the exception. <laughs> yeah, this uh, this skull has the crime part of the brain within it. A homeless man could have been any age between 20 and 30. His skin was a raw red. He was hunched. One eye was half closed, 
But enough about the leader of the Conservative Party. <laughs> his flat stare implied that he had combined his heroin with street valium. In Glasgow, I was told that the homeless simply sit with their cup out, and when it has accumulated ten pounds, their dealer comes and empties the cup and drops off the heroin. And I can tell you this is not true because I've tried. I mean, I just like the idea that they're, they're using a cup with like Wi-Fi that just like sends a signal to the dealer once it's above a certain level. Yeah, smart cup. Techno- technology solutions to the to, to the yeah. new to the new issues. Get on the phone to fucking Dragons Den. We've got a winner here. Yeah, I suppose Rory Stewart would be the one who'd know all about heroin, wouldn't he? <laughs> in a park by Salt Market, I found half an acre of ground covered in discarded needles and equipment for cooking jugs. The only park and anywhere, I thought, ah, perfect. The only park <laughs> near the Salt Market is going to be the fucking um, what is it? The Glasgow Green. That's fucking huge. Any idiot that's trying to avoid police attention is going to go to the Green. That's hardly narrowing it down. The life expectancy of the heaviest drinkers is 29, and of the heroin addicts, 46. I think that tells you everything about the quality of beer in Glasgow. <laughs> At I mean, least in... heroin addicts should just walk it off. <laughs> <laughs> At least in Sunderland and Hartlepool, there are some services which you can access for addiction or support. But I found there was almost nothing for the addicts in Easington Colliery, where houses cost £15,000 and nothing has replaced the mine. Hmm. Oh, if only the Tories didn't shut the mine down then. Yeah, and no wonder there's no fucking services when they cut them all, you fucking piece of shit. Oh my god, how can you... Uh, yeah, exactly. How can you How can you just blithely say, oh, there's no services, and not go, I wonder why. What? Oh, they just live on a different fucking planet. It's unbelievable. My favourite line from this is still the bit about Tacky earlier, but this, this <laughs> next line's still great. It was difficult to learn from professionals and charities. They seemed so allergic to Tory politicians that any questions were immediately diverted into furious attacks on austerity. I wonder fucking why. I wonder fucking why, yeah. Is he, is he, do you think he's genuinely this fucking oblivious? Or yes, is he yes just they really all the, are. No, no. <laughs> my, my question is, is he really this fucking oblivious? Or is he just, like... I, I, well, he's asking, he's writing for the spectator, so I'm answering my own fucking question, haven't I? Yes. No, he, he's, he's, he's still out his tits. He's on a permo. <laughs> <laughs> it, oh, they just... Whenever, whenever these people just spurt out their half-baked and un, unthought thoughts into, you know, the real world, it just becomes so apparent how unable they are to connect with any reality that any of us, you know, the the Untermensch experience on day-to-day, in day-to-day life, you know, fucking homeless people are essentially just some problem to be stepped over as you walk into the halls, uh, palaces of Westminster. It's literally just galling when they talk like this. I've spent 15 years cutting public services and now there are no public services. What's happening? I had more luck with volunteers. Mary chatted to me while handing over bags of condensed milk and cereal. She'd been coming in to help with in the food bank every week for the last two years and seemed to know everyone. This girl's removed herself from... Oh, good, so it's not a systemic long-term issue then, is it? <laughs> this girl removed herself from school at 14. I'm trying to convince her to go back. Them, they're drunk. A flailing fist fight had erupted between two women near the statue of Our Lady. I'm not sure why they're queuing for kids' food. They don't have kids. How did she afford those hair extensions? They cost seventy pound. I loved her Fuck. energy and cheerfulness and the lack of solemn piety. Right, Ugh. she said at the end. That's my guilt dealt with for the week. I'm going paddleboarding. What the fuck? <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> the and he's found one of the people who put him into fucking office. The answer has to begin with recruiting, training, and backing more Marys. Oh my uh, god. Thoughtful. Yeah, let's. Realistic. Let's fucking, oh, good humored people. Some in social. Good humored. Yeah. Good humored. Some in social, youth, and probation work. Some volunteers patiently helping people through all the challenges from addiction to a simple lack of hope. Yeah, by Please click of, here to oh. apply for your job in the home office. Press what one. We need, what we need Press is 1488. 
<laughs> what we need is more Marys, people who will nominally help people who are vulnerable, but also shit on them behind their back. Well, not even to, and behind, really behind their back. It sounds like they're in the fucking room. Yeah. <laughs> I've just finished Good reading Lord. Blitzed, a beautifully researched book about drugs in Nazi Germany. <laughs> of course oh, he did. I wonder why. <laughs> the Blitzkrieg was fuel, it text. seems, on crystal meth. <laughs> It allowed, the Panzer yeah, driver, idea. it allowed the Panzer drivers to go for three days without sleep and gave suicidal confidence to the waves of attacking German troops. The success of a reckless charge against all odds just strengthened their optimism. By 1944, Hitler was maintaining the Fuhrer confidence with six injections a day. Some were cocktails of pig's blood, which didn't affect his belief that he was a vegetarian. But increasingly, it was combinations of heroin, which... Reminder, Rory Stewart has confirmed he's taken, and methamphetamine. The generals, astonished at his optimism in the face of all negative reports on every front, assumed he must have a secret weapon. The secret was chemically induced. Is this going to conclude with him saying that really what we should do is just make sure that all the heroin addicts also get given methamphetamine so that they can become and guns. productive members of society? <laughs> How did how did Rory Stewart Godwin himself? <laughs> what happened here? <laughs> Years of practice, I imagine. Yesterday, I was worrying about my cherry trees, what we call Gin in my part of Britain, and what the spectator or reader would call Prunus avium. We planted forty of them to mark our wedding seven years ago. Can I just go back a sec? He says what we'd call this in my part of Britain and what the spectator reader would call something else. He's been a spectator reader since 11. <laughs> well, he's got to affect that, you know, down-to-earth parole charm. Like, it's just definitely so, affected. <laughs> uh, yeah, we planted 40 of them to mark our wedding seven years ago. One is thick, healthy, and 20 feet high. The others are in terrible states. Black and welting <laughs> leaves. Leaves shredded by aphids. Barks torn to the core by roe deer. They all no, share this. Makes it, this makes it sound like he's just got this like um, necrotic touch. Like <laughs> he's just like one of them. One of them survived. <laughs> I think his time reading about Nazi Germany may have led him onto other books about Nazi Germany, which use similar language. <laughs> they all share the same sun in the same field, and I have put new shelters around all of them. But after seven years, some are barely four foot tall. Is he working? Is he working up towards a metaphor here of some kind? Maybe we should try giving him some methamphetamine. Twice I've replaced some of the most sickly, so now there are now th there are now three batches struggling in the field. Every spring, I hope the problem will be solved. I suspect the soil and the cherries simply don't agree, but I cannot seem to change course. I am a great one for accusing other people of fairy tale optimism about Iraq, Afghanistan, or no deal Brexit. But when it comes to my cherry trees, my megalomaniac fantasies are on full display. Failure what? is not an option. What the fuck? <laughs> That's the end of the article. <laughs> yeah. This is the equivalent of just like cut to black, roll credits. What the fuck was that? <laughs> That's like watching a Tarantino movie. That was oh. fucking. What the fuck was that? Here's some. Here's some pool stomping. Here's my thoughts on the Nazis and why actually they did good things. Um, and then here is some weird dig at people that read the Spectator, except ho ho, I'm one of you. And then here's some more very. 1930s language that if you did apply, take away the application to trees and provided it against any one group of people would be terrifying and yeah. then he makes a megalomaniac statement about trees. You see what happened is that the type of tree just doesn't agree with the soil and the trees should be in their own soil, it just makes sense yeah. I think I think that last paragraph is meant to sort of paint them as, as down to earth and, and sort of introspective you know he has faults too. I mean, just like just like the average man in the street, he's a megalomaniac who, who can't be told that like cherry trees don't grow on British soil or or whatever. I mean, at no point there he mentions asking anyone who knows anything about fucking trees what he should do. 
<laughs> just, no, just, just guess and power through it, like that's the Tory way. <laughs> yeah, just do whatever the fuck and see what sticks, you know. Like, oh whatever. Jesus! I, t- I take the I take the same approach to my politics. <laughs> it's just do whatever the fuck. Oh, I'm not a Tory anymore. Who knows why? Who can possibly say? Well, I think this episode we have given MPs quite a lot of um, quite a lot of our time, and we've really not been. We've not been kind enough to give the time to the commentariat. So how about we round off this episode with a little game of comment or commentariat? Oh, hit me. Hit me, baby. I'm yeah, ready. Let's do it. For anyone that doesn't know the rules and didn't hear the last episode, what we do is I will read out something that I have found on the internet. It is either a commentariat who has written a lovely little piece and I have... Ex- taking a little piece of that out to give to you or it's a comment from below the line and it's up to you lot to find out which it is comment or commentary at so let's get started the nhs must put boris on a 24 hour suicide watch he's admitted he would rather be dead in a ditch than request an extension and that the october 31st is a do or die deadline Will he throw himself under his infamous campaign bus? Hopefully he will not slowly choke on all his lies. He might fall on this he might fall on his own sword, or would that be too honourable? Comment or commentary at I'm gonna go comment. That sounds a bit too um just a little bit too bootlicky. That to sounds be... that sounds to me like a comment by someone who really, really wants to be commentary at. That's a running theme. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to say commentariat just based on the language used. I'm, yeah, also, using co- I'm also going for commentariat, so we'll get an even split, two for two. Excellent, excellent. That was a comment oh, from the BBC yes. News website. Well, wait, sorry? The BBC News website. Oh, BBC, perfect. <laughs> Part of me suspected wow. it may be comment be given the such recency of the dead in a ditch comment um but i, I still thought commentary yet so fair oh, fair, wonder... fair play to that commenter let's go with a little short one this time it was boris johnson who actually won his first prime minister's questions and corbyn <laughs> is now on the back foot i think i think i know who this is actually well, I think you don't because mind. there's two of them and it's commentary <laughs> as commentary he's got to be commentary yeah, that I, one i agree yeah, probably. Yep, it is commentary, and that is our good friend John, John, John Rent- Rental. Oh, yes. Oh, so did, I'm so glad he managed to find more blood. So I'm gonna I'm gonna shock you all by saying the Spectator has uh, a, an article up which says pretty much the same thing, except by Toby Young. <laughs> <laughs> Carbon not Boris was the real loser on Tuesday. Is the headline. That's the oh. fucking that's the fucking dream team right there, Toby Young and, and shit Dracula. <laughs> I cannot wait right. for the Toby Young episode. I just I just <laughs> want to say quickly, like um, I don't know if you guys are familiar at all with Eve Online, but there's um there's this uh, thing where uh, if a side that's losing a war uh, is re- like you know they're on the verge of just losing it completely, they start saying actually no, we wanted to lose that. Now we're freed from the shackles of. Uh, this part of the game, we could do something else. And I just get the vibe from um, all these people, like Toby Young and John Rental, that when inevitably um, this government falls, it, it's going to be like it's it's going to be the the good thing. It's going to be a good thing for the Tory Party to now be in opposition. Now they can really get to work on on their agenda. And it's just like, mate, come on. Just for a minute, can you can you not just see what everyone else sees? And it's obviously a bad thing. Why can't you just see it and say it? Oh. You've clearly you've you've clearly descended into madness and turned into a prophet. <laughs> from that aspect, it reminds me of certain things that we've seen most recently from the Egyptian government before they were overthrown. Um, but we've seen at various points through history, whereby governments that don't want to admit that they're losing. Instead, to just have the newspaper articles um, reporting wins closer and closer and closer to the capital. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
Oh, go on, let's do the next one. Let's, let's smash uh, these out. <laughs> yeah, well, fuck it, let's do another one. Cummings fancies himself as the great disruptor, and he's getting away with it. Here's a disruption. The rebel Tories, including Churchill's grandson, the father of the Commons, and an ex-Chancellor, should seize the mace, bring it across <laughs> the road, proclaiming that they are the Conservative and Unionist Party, and act on Rory Stewart's suggestion to form a new parliament. Comment... Or commentary. Yeah. Comment. I'm comment. Oh, I feel like I want, I want to say I want to say commentary because that sounds like something. Um, some one of those. Um, you know, Rory Stewart supporting uh, commentary at journals would yeah, say. Yeah, I mean, if that's, commentary if that's a comment, you all are reading some very different comments to the ones I read. No, there's it's lots of sort of highbrow trying too hard things. The thing that I feel like gives it away is the fact that none of the commentary would endorse taking the mace because that's a thing for John McDonnell. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not forget the last person who did it was um, Lloyd Russell Moyle. Yeah, I, no, what a lad he is. Absolutely. But I feel like that only re reconfirms my point of it's only for good lads. Yeah, true. That is right. true. So, who is it? What is it? That was... Comment. <laughs> Damn. It came from comment is free because of course it did. Got it. <laughs> On your point about the mace, I would like to point out that other pe- that Michael Heseltine has also grabbed the mace at one point. Oh, no. So not oh, just no. he grabbed it when Labour MPs started to sing the red flag <laughs> after <laughs> after they nationalized large parts of UK aerospace and shipbuilding industries. Hashtag <laughs> <laughs> lads. <laughs> oh right okay another one um i'll give you a wee bit of uh i'm just as an excerpt from a fairly fairly sizable chunk i'm not going to read the whole thing out but the context of it is is about being a teacher mm-hmm. and not becoming one in the first place i never found out because the one thing stopping me from being a teacher was that i could not remotely conceive of not trying to shag the kids it seemed to be virtually impossible not to. I, I'm going to send this one out because I already that, know the answer. Because yeah, I, I know the is. answer to that. Like that, and that is. Um, I'm not going to. I know. I know. I think. Exactly that's, I think is. is this the Toby Young episode? It's not Toby Young. <laughs> no, oh my god! Not, there's another one. Young. Oh, is it Jails Corbin? No. Is, it, <laughs> is he only interested in his daughter? There are, there are oh, far yeah. too many oh, noncy fucking commentary around, aren't there, really, when you think about it? Shocking no, how they're all right wing. If it's not Toby Young, I don't know who it is, but I'm going to say yeah, commentary, because oh, that, de- that seems depraved enough to be a commentary. It's, it's, it it's absolutely Robert, is commentary. <laughs> yep, that's right. It was Rob Liddell in The Spectator back in oh, 2012. 2012. I just wanted to highlight that. <laughs> yeah. I just uh, wanted to highlight that. The reason you Absolutely know it's not the area is because if it was a comment, then GCHQ would track you down and arrest you. <laughs> Unless you remember the Conservative Party. I was going to say, I'll give you a lordship. <laughs> <laughs> right, and finally, we're going to break convention because we've only had one episode, so I can do what the fuck I like with this. <laughs> no gods, no masters. But decorum! Being a king's scholar at Eton a Queen's Scholar at Westminster, or to obtain the highest accolade, an election scholarship at Winchester, brings great prestige in these schools. The British like genuinely bright people, but not swanks and swats, and recoil from conceit and arrogance of the continental type of intellectual, which is why most ordinary Britons have no time for middle-class Marxists. Comment. Comment or commentary at? Comment. Commentary. I've gone on. God, I could barely even follow that fucking drivel. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm, yeah. I'm going to say comment. I'm going commentary because I've got I've got a very low opinion of of the commentary. <laughs> so I think I've got I'm utterly convinced that they could say something as just. I, 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 I definitely well, sounds a low opinion. A low opinion is appropriate here because while it was only a comment. It was from Quillette. <laughs> <laughs> Middle class Marxist. Yeah, love it. Yeah, best for the right can get. <laughs> oh, damn. Right, well, I think we should probably 
knock it on the head. Round it off there, yeah. All right, well, it's, uh, it's been fun. Oh, it's uh, it's gonna only gonna get more fun. Yep, we do have many more people in the rotating cast to join in, so look forward to that. And yep, we'll see you when we see you. Thanks for tuning Thanks, in, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. All right, Bye. cheers, everyone.